Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayic. Major show alert. The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. All these elements of culture, both the structural as well as the people or the mindset, they're all interconnected. Mm-hmm. Like they're so deeply interconnected that when you try to change one piece, it's actually trying to change the whole thing. So who is Michael Sahura? Um, What's been your journey? Like, I know a lot of people, I I think I've known you since maybe 2015. I've reached out, you were uh, still in Toronto. Uh, I think I was trying to get you to come to Agile Maine event. Um, But what what has been your journey? Who, like, you know, people that uh, that don't know you well, uh, who's Michael, what you like to do? What's been your journey this you know, in this agile world and how did you get involved in it? Yeah. So, so, uh, I guess maybe the starting place is I, I've changed a lot. And so like kind of my new branding is Michael K. Sahota, right. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, from where I was in the past, cause there's, there's, a, there's a really big change. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I grew up here in Toronto and I went through engineering. I actually went through the hardest program at the University of Toronto, this really hardcore Mm -hmm. engineering program. Went on to uh, do my master's degree in uh, computer science. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's where I did some really extraordinary research and work with artificial intelligence and robotics of how do Mm -hmm. we actually get um, machines to operate in complex environments, right? And so my work with complexity and understanding and understanding systems and how things work at a very deep fundamental started. And uh, so I did, after that, I did a half, half a PhD until I realized, wait a minute, I like being very practical. I like creating very concrete success and academics was too theoretical for me. So mm-hmm. I changed gears, I moved back to, it was on the West coast in Vancouver. So it went back to Toronto and started working as a, a software developer. And then, you know, very, very quickly progressed senior developer, architect, you know, technical lead, you know, then I moved on to management roles. So I've Mm -hmm. held, uh, you know, director of software development, vice president of engineering. So, and all that time, you know, very early on, actually, uh, you know, a couple of years in, I got involved with Agile, originally with extreme programming. And -hmm. it was just like, well, that's just how you get things done. Like, you know, you know, and, Mm -hmm. and, and I guess my, my experience was I, I actually tried to run a project the normal way with, with a Gantt chart and just like everyone. And it was like, Oh my God, this is so painful. Like, yeah. and, and that's when I, that's when I looked and said, well, there's gotta be a better way. And, and then, you know, got involved with agile. How did you uh, first learn about agile? Like what was your experience? Like first learning about yeah. uh, or hearing about agile or scrum? Yeah. Or so XP, this is going back know? to 2001 and the yeah. actual first experience was through extreme programming. Yeah. and very much focused on, well, let's get unit tests going. Let's get continuous integration. So I, you know, I, I, I hand built an integration server, what people now call continuous integration or DevOps, you know, yeah. back in 2001, <laughs> step by step by hand, we were running scripts, right? And it was mm-hmm. it's incredible. And I could see the power of the, the technology, the power of testing, the power of pairing. the like, So it was just this really deep experience. And then my understanding of Agile came through Alistair Coburn's book, Mm -hmm. uh, Agile Software Development. It's a very, very beautiful book because he goes right to the kind of the heart of what Agile is about, which is about people. And, you know, and so, I mean, he totally botched everything out with calling it crystal clear and crystal this and blah. I mean, it's too too theoretical for people that people need something more tangible. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to tell them, hey, Agile is about people and, you know, got to work with people. It's like, well, yeah, but then what, right? so uh, yeah, so that's how I got started. And then in 2004, I went to a uh, certified scrum master training with some guy called uh, Ken Schwaber, <laughs> right? That guy, so, yeah. <laughs> it was like really, really early on. And then I we went to a scrum gathering in Boston where there were, you know, it was held, held in this old fire hall and there were 80 people. And like, you know, it was like, it was really like early, early days, but I, I only yeah. saw Agile as part of my toolkit. Like I was never like, mm-hmm. oh, this is the sauce. I must go and pursue this. Like <laughs> some people did, right? And that was their path. That wasn't my path. My path was to go on and just use agile XP scrum just as part of like 
you know, a subset of all the other things I need to do to create success. Mm -hmm. And so I was very, very successful as, you know, in leadership roles, team lead, management roles, introducing agile, that worked really well because I could hold the system. But when I started switching gears and I started working as a trainer and consultant, it was a totally different situation. And I was like, wait a minute, there's so many challenges getting agile actually working in organizations. It's like mind boggling. And I, I was, I mean, I really wanted to be successful. So I was, I was like, wait a second, what's going on here? Well, like the culture's not right. The leadership's right. Mm -hmm. I wrote my book, an agile adoption and transformation survival guide. And back way yeah. back, way back in 2012 yeah. to tell people that, Hey, guess what? Agile is a culture system. And if you mm -hmm. don't integrate that into everything you do, you're just going to annoy people and waste a lot of energy and create a lot of failure, which mm -hmm. is kind of fast forward to where we are today. There's a <laughs> lot of people being annoyed by agile. There's a lot of failure, like, you know, agile transformations still have a, I'd say a 90% failure rate. Um, so if not, if not higher, then, <laughs> what's that? If not higher, <laughs> if not higher. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, well, I mean, the actual truth is it's impossible to create a successful agile transformation because yeah. it has the word agile. And it has the word transformation. Both of them actually prevent real change from happening. But but that's a much longer story. So let me let me finish my story. So yeah, this is back in 2012, I had that realization. And then that led me to understanding, well, wait a minute, it's actually about the leadership. And then so I was doing my own, you know, kind of homebrewed training work. You know, I called it mm -hmm. a culture training to get agile working. And then after a while, the... Um, some people at Scrum Alliance, really great group, created the Certified Agile Leadership Program. And I was mm -hmm. like, the first person to sign up and say, yep, I'll do that. And the first yeah. person to deliver training worldwide and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I trained most of the people, I think for the first couple of years, I think I had like 30 or 40% of all the graduates were from our training. Yeah. And uh, so really- And the feedback was, I remember like everybody, like there were CSDs taking your training. Everybody was like, just uh, uh, really, uh, impressed with how they like, you know, came out of that training and, uh, you know, how their maybe perspectives have changed after that training. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, I can talk about that in a moment, but let me, so the, so the story <laughs> yeah, okay. fast forward, uh, uh, fast forward about me is I realized that I was the limit for change and mm -hmm. that I wasn't fully embodying the agile mindset. I wasn't embodying an, an evolved culture system that the way I was showing up, there's no way I could help other leaders evolve. And so I went on this immense personal growth journey. Um, actually, one of the phrases that sparked it off was, you can only be kind to others to the extent that you can be kind to yourself. And that really like opened me up and led to a couple of years of really deep, deep growth of, of really looking at how kind I was to myself and what was going on in my inner world. Mm -hmm. So fast forward a couple of years, did many, many experiments of trying this, trying that. And eventually I wound up in India studying at a school of consciousness because these were the guys who had the real, the, some really powerful technology for creating change and shifts. Mm -hmm. um, fast forward, uh, actually at, at there I met uh, the woman who became my wife, Audrey, and we've been working together to co-create uh, like an incredible set of technology, both around mm -hmm. organizational change, around culture change, leadership change. But also more importantly about this, you know, how do we actually create an inner shift? How do we change like at a core basic level, these really deeply ingrained behavior patterns so mm -hmm. we can show up as a more evolved leader, right? Anyone can go and do like a leadership circle and say, oh, I got all these gaps, right? And then it's like, fuck, now what? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> so instead of doing that, we just actually help give people the shifts that they need. And we can do this because we've gone on our own journeys. We've walked through our own darkness and we've built an incredible technology for helping people create rapid shifts. And that's what people have been experiencing in these trainings. So is that those shifts? Yeah, those shifts that you mentioned, are those uh, like vertical stage development shifts or cognitive shifts? Like what would you like, how, what type of shifts are you talking about? And what, yeah. yeah. Okay. So. So for us to be effective, we need doing and being. Mm -hmm. So we need to have very practical skills, new ways of working, right? Mm -hmm. But without a mindset shift or a shift in consciousness, a shift of worldview, exactly. a shift yeah. of perspective about ourselves and a shift of perspective mm -hmm. about others, 
Uh, we, we call that a shift in consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. And we look at the book, Reinventing Organizations, it talks about an evolved consciousness, mm -hmm. right? Operating, and that's really what we see as, a, as people move through more and more evolved cultures, there's a shift, right? I mean, there's so many people that talk about it, you know, from me mm -hmm. to we, and like everybody talks about this shift, but ultimately this is a shift in our inner being, right? Mm -hmm. A shift in how we see ourselves and how we see the world. That's what we call a shift in consciousness as yeah. an integrative term to talk about all these phenomena that people said, oh, you need to have a shift, but this is the core piece. And it's about how do we help people who want to show up amazing, who want to create amazing workplaces, how do we help them make that shift inside of themselves? Mm -hmm. And that's the, like you said, that's that, that's that worldview shift. That's that uh, kind of perspective. That that's uh, you know evolving your values and beliefs, right? Um, and, and trying to uh, better understand like who you are, what, what's important to you, right? And uh, uh, what what type of you, you talked about cultural system right and obviously uh, this shift in mindset is tied to that cultural shift could you or oh, cultural system sorry could you talk about you described as a, uh, a culture system could you maybe elaborate a little bit on what you mean by culture system and then how this shift in um, mindset is tied to that culture system yeah that's a that's a that's a great question so yeah, we, we actually, in, our, in our, the technology we created, there are many, many different ways to look at culture and they're all useful for different, different purposes. Um, but the one I'll share now uh, like, is that we can understand the culture of an organization as the sum of all the behaviors of all the people. Mm -hmm. The way people show up is your culture. If people are kind, supportive, building other leaders around them, that's one kind of culture. If people are covering their ass, afraid, um, you know, you know, kind of in a scarcity mindset, competing, that's a different kind of culture, right? So the way people behave across the whole organization, how everyone behaves at all levels, mm -hmm. that is the culture. So from that perspective, you say, well, if I want to change from one culture to another, guess what? <laughs> people need to behave differently. Yeah. Otherwise, there is no culture change. <laughs> Right. So exactly. it's like, uh, yeah. Did you notice that if you want to change culture, people actually need to behave differently and that's what it means. And people are like, Oh, I never <laughs> thought that way. Right. But this is, this yeah. is kind of like the core of what we've created is a way to simplify teaching of what we call the laws of organizational dynamics or these deep truths about how things work. Mm -hmm. and, and it's kind of like, it's almost like really embarrassing. Like, it's not like we're, we're trying to convince people or teach them these models. We just kind of go, hey, did you notice that things kind of work like this? And people go like, oh, oh yeah, wow, things work like that. And, the, and yeah. what that does is it, it creates a shift in their worldview. And it gives mm -hmm. them a way to start seeing how they've been going against the grain, right? To start mm -hmm. seeing how, and this is the core of, of really what lets people really unlock is to see how they're the problem and they're the solution, how their beliefs in, in, in ac inaccurate beliefs have been mm -hmm. getting in the way of creating change. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, something that struck me in the sense that you just said inaccurate beliefs, right? Uh, uh, I don't know if I would call it inaccurate beliefs, right? Because they're all like, we all have, you know, in a way that they, they, they're maybe, there's some truth to those beliefs, but uh, uh, it is interesting. So, yeah, so that, that, that's a really good point. Um, yeah. You know, you know, there's Don Box quotes that, you know, all models are wrong and some are more useful than others or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah. our view is that um, most people right now, I'd say like about 90% of all agile coaches are running around with a belief system that's actually harmful and damaging mm -hmm. to themselves and the people around them. It's not, I don't think it's just uh, uh, the agile, right? Uh, you said you went back to India, right? And th there is a different, you know, Eastern philosophies versus Western philosophies. And if we even go back to lean, the way the lean, uh, lean embraced both doing and being, right? Lean uh, from Japan was a lot different than how it was interpreted in the West. So, so lean, <laughs> lean, let me just go back. Lean is the Western interpretation. Oh, yeah. Lean exactly. itself. <laughs> lean itself. So, so this is what happens. Uh, Toyota had a, had a um, 
a fairly evolved consciousness, mm -hmm. right? And they created structures that matched that consciousness, that mindset, that understanding. Mm -hmm. And some people who had a lower consciousness from the West come in and study it, and they reinterpret it through their lower consciousness, and they label it lean. Yeah. That's why lean has failed worldwide, pretty much, in achieving. And no, no, because what, what they're missing is the mindset. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're really the only case studies that were successful. If you go back to Numi with GM and Toyota, it's where... <laughs> Big the photos. <laughs> well, no, no, it's where, it's where Toyota was directly involved and made yeah. sure the new leadership, everyone in the new leadership had the right mindset. And then it worked, right? But so yeah, but it, it reminded me of like, you know, what we see a lot in Agile today, like in the Numi, like, you know, in the case study or the, the at least the podcast that I listened to, they said like, you know, how a GM, the manager said, go take the photos <laughs> of what they're doing at Toyota so we can duplicate what they're doing. And today and then we see like so much that in Agile too. Go copy that framework. Go copy the Spotify <laughs> framework yeah, so or do this. Right. Well, so that's a very natural thing because that's what you said. It's just not just an agile. The current mm -hmm. prevailing management mindset mm -hmm. is a management mindset. It's a administrative um, sort of in, you know, Frederick Leloux's model, orange or machine metaphor. Yeah. And a machine, you have a mechanical system. So you want to get the blueprint for the machine. You want to copy other people's machines. You want to install new machine parts. So copy and pasting other people's solutions is a very natural metaphor. But this is a very mm -hmm. low consciousness approach. So it can only create a low consciousness outcome, right? Yeah. Like if you use a cut and paste solution, you're going to get a, the quality of a cut and paste versus mm -hmm. an authentic creation of what's seeking to be unearthed in that organization, which will mm -hmm. actually be the path to, you know, people being engaged, higher performance, faster delivery and all that. Um, and so this is a nat this is where we say that the, the, the change approach itself limits the effectiveness of the outcome and mm -hmm. most agile change approaches are a total disaster because they use this cut and paste we're going to have a rollout plan yeah a very low consciousness change approach to try to introduce a new mindset and way of being and it's like what like how do you think this can work like this is like yeah. kind of a beginner's mis beginner level mistake from our from our view yeah and, and maybe they don't understand you know, culture agile is a culture system so you know they yeah. can't even begin to understand that uh, uh, how how wrong that, that's why people have these mind-blowing experiences we just say well do you notice it works like this and they go like <laughs> and they're like heads <laughs> explode right you know? yeah so you talked about minds so you talked about behaviors uh i'm thinking about and i use at least as a, as a uh reference uh, integral uh quadrants right i don't know what your thought is on that but just referencing back to that like the systems quadrant uh, like for instance, if we look at you know organizational policies, if we look at the structures, right, those influence behavior as well, and in return, the behavior and those policies influence the culture, right? Um, what are you seeing as far as like uh, how does that how do the organizational systems impact the behavior and culture, and what are some of the things that uh you see or you you you're helping organizations to 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 evolve those as well yeah so so the evolution of organizational systems and structures it's a very natural process mm -hmm. once there's a shift in in people yeah right it's a very very natural process sometimes we can use structures to support creating a shift with people um mm -hmm. but mostly the, the they're laggard the, the lag now now here's where you're going to do a chicken and egg problem the structures promote and establish people showing up a certain way and people mm -hmm. showing up a certain way fits you know hand in glove right. yeah <laughs> that that's why so i mean really the technology we created to crack this this puzzle and it's a very very powerful model is the sahoda or we call it the shift 314 culture model which mm -hmm. is to understand that all these elements of culture, both the structural as well as the people or the mindset, they're all interconnected. Mm -hmm. Like they're so deeply interconnected that when you try to change one piece, it's actually trying to change the whole thing. Exactly. Right? So attempts to change structure. Um, and, you know, I mean, there, there's Craig Larman who says culture follows structure and he's created immense damage through that. <laughs> that teaching. I it's, know, actually, it, it's actually true in a very 
it's a partial view of it because you're only looking at, you know, it's a feedback well, loop, right? In it's, a sense. it's true. If you change your structures, it can support a shift in culture. But hold on, who is changing the structures? <laughs> what is the mindset from which they're changing the structures? Are, yeah. are they changing the structures with the people or making the change and imposing the structures on the people? Like there's so much about how the structures can change. And we know, I, I know I've talked to Baz Vode, like, they've been very successful with up to a hundred people mm -hmm. where the leaders have already made a sh some sort of inner shift. They don't really think about it that way. But when I listen yeah. to, you know, them actually describing real case studies, that's what was there. There was a, the leader's willingness to grow. Mm -hmm. Then the structure, a structure change where it can be used as an aid, like a job aid. Right. Yeah. Now, but here's the challenge. Like what comes first? Do people change first to the structures? And what we've seen is that, it's actually the people changing first. That's actually mm -hmm. what's going to lead and enable structures to be changing in an effective, intelligent way. Otherwise, there's no way to break this, this kind of deadlock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like, and, and like a lot of things that I do, I try to reference back to my experience and try to make sense out of things, right? So like, uh, I grew up in Sarajevo. And that part of the Balkans, like we're killing each other every 50 years, right? There's a war, like, you know, the World War I started there. We're like, every <laughs> when there's mess in Europe or in the world, we're, we're involved, right? Um, and one of the things, like, if we just, if I, you know, I, I, I was contemplating and thinking about just the whole idea, like, what would happen? Like, you know, you change the system. We had a leader from at the end of the World War II through uh, 1980s. And he created a system which changed the mindset, but it's his, you know, uh, leadership, <laughs> dictatorship style that created that system. It's uh, in his peers. Um, and how that whole uh, mindset uh, creates the behavior or influences behaviors and influences the system and how they in, in the return <laughs> influence each other. It's like, it, it's, an, it's in everything. It's not just organization. It's like, like you said, you know, it's right in front of us here. Like this whole thing, like we're making it so much more complicated or complex uh, than what it is. But most of these transformations fail. And yet the answer is right there in front of us in a sense that until we kind of cognitively grow, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's really hard to make any of these changes sustainable and uh, uh, Maybe to to, to 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 that question, then how much does the environment then shape our mindset, and how do we involve the mindset? Then, uh, what are some of the things uh, you know you've written two, three now three books? You have a book coming out uh, soon. Uh, what do you tell? I mean, what's uh, what's your take on evolving mindset? How do we? Go, uh, go past the current perspectives and worldviews that we have. Yeah, so uh, the question is, of course, immense. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there, there are many, many different levels I can answer. I think the one, that, the one that's coming to me now is Yeah, the one that's coming to me now is that if we look at changing mindset within an organization, mm -hmm. is it the mindset of the leadership or the mindset of the workers that needs to change first to create a shift in the whole organization? Oh, well, it's those who have power because the, the, the masses will follow the lead of everybody else. So it's okay, well, mm -hmm. so, so what's going on with the leadership? And I say leadership at all levels because every mm -hmm. manager can change their part of the, so, so change of culture and leadership is a local phenomenon. It's not a, talking about the whole. So anybody can, anyone in any organization who has any power, either formal and formal can lead a shift. So just mm -hmm. wanna clarify that. So now that we clarify that we have many, many leaders in, in organizational systems, the question is, well, what's the prevailing mindset Right. And we look at things like, mm -hmm. oh, well, people believe in servant leadership. Right. And this is what we go to into our book, uh, upcoming book, Leading Beyond Change, is that servant leadership is a 50 year old paradigm. And it's failed. It has failed to produce a shift. This is mm -hmm. a fact. When people try to save it by adding all of these extensions and blah, 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 and it's not working. So, 
we introduce, uh, and there's, there's information about this on our website. People can download PDF, PDF if they want. Um, uh, uh, a term that's been used before, and we've kind of coined, we coined our own definition of it, which is evolutionary leadership. Mm -hmm. And we define evolutionary leadership is the choice to evolve oneself and learn how to evolve the organization, right? So imagine if every leader, if you have a leader who's mm -hmm. ready to evolve themselves, their inner state of being, their mindset and so on, their skills and how they approach things and, and learn practical skills to have that shift land in the system. So they know how to, these new patterns of interaction based on their evolved mindset and consciousness. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you have a leader like that, what will happen with their team, their department, their group, their organization? Oh. It's going to start changing. Huh. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of the fundamental element of evolution. Now, and why do we say there's a fundamental, fundamental element, ele elephant, element? The fundamental <laughs> element. <laughs> fundamental Cause, elephant. Because yeah. everyone's heard this phrase you can't change anyone, you can only change yourself. And so it's really a matter of individual choice of do people want to evolve that's it a lot and exactly so like i see i see a bit bit troubling because uh, a lot of times because of that uh you know whatever you want to call it ego or uh, you know i recently spoke ego is a good word ego is a very good word <laughs> uh i spoke that's with what the, this whole game is about uh -huh. actually it is it is but like it goes back and i'm puzzled uh, by this i i can't i mean i i can i know but i don't which is i asked the leader like you know in a sense like why wouldn't they do something in a sense like you know they, they, they were debating you know and they're like well the policy like you know my bonus is impacted by this so they struggled right they knew what was right and they went that border you know from a, from an ego like where do i let go a little bit of my ego where i don't but at the same time the environment is like oh i'm paying my kids college tuition which is very expensive which probably you can relate to that i know last time we spoke you said yeah <laughs> so, uh, and uh, they're like you know it's between me doing the right thing what i know is right which is and then supporting my family and I go back to people like, what was the first thing when COVID hit? What, what most people thought? You didn't think about how am I going to help somebody else? Usually it's like, is my family safe, right? So like how much does the environment dictate? <laughs> and that's what I'm puzzled. I don't know if you have an answer yeah, to that. So, uh, yeah, so, um, you know, our you know what I'm saying though? Do you understand? Our, our, we, we only ask people to make themselves successful. Yeah. If, if, if I'm working with a leader whose bonus is tied to destroying the team and getting a product out and, and really just eliminating and reducing long-term profitability, mm -hmm. that it's totally fair game for them to do that because that's what their bonus structure is. And they, may need, they need to look after themselves and their family. Now, yeah. probably what I'd say at the same time, though, is like, maybe you want to look at talk to whoever gave you this objective, what the consequence of it will be and see mm -hmm. if there's some other way to create a win-win. Because right now there's a win-lose going on, yeah. right? And that's why you're in conflict. We don't want people to be in conflict. We don't want to tell people they need to be evolved and make sensible choices. Mm -hmm. That's not how it works in high-performance organizations. In yeah. high-performance organizations, and this is one of, our, one of the key principles that is in, actually everything we put together is yeah. part of what we call this shift 314 evolutionary leadership framework or, or self framework. It's a mm -hmm. framework for how to evolve people and organizational systems from where they are to higher levels of, of productivity and success. But, but a core, one, one of the core principles is that employee self-interest is the highest form of corporate alignment. Mm -hmm. I'll say that again, it's really important. Employee self-interest is the highest form of corporate alignment. So it's just basically a recognition. Look, people have egos. People mm -hmm. are optimizing locally what's good for them. This is the fact of the ego. We optimize locally for what's best yeah. for me. Let's just make sure that everyone's personal interest, their ego lines up to, to end up with good outcomes for their team, for their group, for the whole organization. Like why yeah. fight the ego? You can't win against the <laughs> ego. Let's, if you can't fix it, this is what I learned in software. If you can't fix it, feature it. 
<laughs> uh, and which is like it's an ingrained in us. So like something else that I've uh, heard you say, which this is a slow process. Like it, it takes time. We have to be patient with it, right? Who, who said it's a slow process? I well, thought, we I thought that's absolutely yeah. true. But it, it, yeah. there, there's only one limiting factor. Yeah, ourselves. Which is, which is which is our rate of evolution. And so yeah. part of what we've created is evolutionary tools to help people evolve very rapidly. Yeah. Right. You know, in the old world, it's like, oh, I can't change. You know, I had this behavior my whole life. I, I you know, I might have to go to psychotherapy for 20 years. No, 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 no. Yeah. How can you change in a matter of weeks and months, like with attention? Yeah. It's not, it's not that complex. We have the technology to do that. Once yeah. people have a clear choice, that's what they want for themselves. So the core yeah. of our work, whether it's, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, a one hour you know, lunch and learn or something like that, or an executive briefing or, or the, or, or, or Cal training, it's mm -hmm. creating the desire and the willingness in the path. Once people have a desire, they understand mm -hmm. how they're getting in their own way. There's a very natural desire to start getting out of our own way. And when we mm -hmm. give them the actual tools and path, it unlocks profound change. Mm -hmm. And like that people, is, yeah. routinely, people routinely get promoted after six months. The ones mm -hmm. that you get it, use the tools and so on. Like it's very, very normal because what happens is we stop, learn how to stop creating conflict and start helping other people around us be successful. And then it turns out that people really like that. Uh -huh. Amazing, right? And then they <laughs> like, see us as a leader. <laughs> it's not, it's not uh, rocket it's, science. I was going to say, it's like, you know, it's uh, so, so much, so much of this stuff is just the, uh, you know, not nothing new. It's just that uh, I guess you know we've been. Do you think we've been conditioned into some of this stuff? Uh, yeah, we've uh, been deeply conditioned, and yeah. you know the people who well. So <laughs> we take our best and our brightest, and they go into an MBA program, Masters of Business Administration, and we teach them the way to create high performance is to think like an administrator. Mm -hmm. to think like a manager and manage people and manage resources and manage things and give orders and give directions. And you know what, but the funny thing is what we see from every case study is high performance doesn't come from management. It comes from leadership. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it comes from inspiring people. <laughs> it comes yeah. from nurturing, looking after people. And so like, what if all these, the best and brightest were given training in business leadership instead of business management? Boom. Well, isn't that, I mean, but like you look at the big consulting companies, you look at, you know, the, in like a scaling frameworks, uh, you look, all of that is this more of the same that you just described. Yeah. I mean, so what's all what are we gonna... structures is all focused on managing. Well, see, yeah. this is the, all this, none of the, so basically none of these agile frameworks, there might be some exceptions, but I'll paint a very broad brush. Yeah. Like if you look at them, agile, the core definition is about individuals and interactions over process and tools or people over process. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All these frameworks put what? Process over people. <laughs> All of yeah. them. So all of so them. all of them are in violation of agile. None of yeah. them are true agile frameworks. I mean, they're frameworks about agile process. They're agile process frameworks. They're not agile frameworks. They don't include the doing and the being. They just include, the, or they doing. tack on. They say, oh, well, <laughs> yeah. You need to have a lean, agile mindset, or you need to have some values and blah, blah. But those, that's just lip service. So, yeah. you know, they don't, they don't that's actually why. do agile. But they're, oh, sorry, yeah. they do do agile. They're just about the doing. <laughs> And that's why, like, the, the podcast is Agile to Agility, which you need both, right? You need Agile and Agility, but we focus so much on Agile and, like you said, not on Agility. So what do you think? I mean, it's been 20 years, right? We, we, just, we talked about it at the beginning uh, since the Agile Manifesto. Uh, a lot has changed, but at the same time, not much has changed because we focused on that big A and doing Agile. What do you think are the next five to 10 years? Um, uh, who do you, uh, you know, uh, are we, do you see more and more focus on being agile and kind of, you know, what you're trying, what you've been promoting for years now? And, uh, right. You, well, so, so just, just to be clear, what we, we teach in our training is to stop doing agile period. All, all, all together, <laughs> uh, in a sense, the big A, let, let the, me, the, let the, me the be clear. Yeah. I'll repeat just, well, now. 
here's the deal. When we look at the core of it, agile is a means to an end, whether the end is agility or business performance or organizational success, agile is a means to an end. So the, when I say stop doing agile, it's about start use, stop doing agile and focusing on agile and start using agile where it fits. Mm -hmm. So agile is optional. Yeah. There are many organizations that have agility without agile. So therefore agile is optional and it's brilliant. Agile has so much value to it and it, mm -hmm. it can help many, many organizations, maybe even most organizations. However, Focusing on agile is the problem. Anyone who self-identifies as an agile coach, they're part of the problem because they're wedded to the word agile. Yeah. And I'll even go back. And I remember when I was being interviewed for being a, this is 10 years ago, maybe 11 years ago now, for being a certified enterprise coach with the Scrum Alliance. And I was getting tested and they said, well, Mike, I go, well, do you guys have any concerns is the, in this live interview? And uh, one guy says, well, Michael, I'm really concerned because you're only talking about Scrum. And I go, well, I thought I was only supposed to talk about Scrum. Do you want me to talk about all the stuff I do with Kanban and Lean and how that interoperates and integrates? And they're going like, yeah, could you tell us about that? And then I started talking. They're like, oh my God, this is amazing. We were really concerned that you only were focused on Scrum. Scrum but we yeah. have a broader view, right? Mm -hmm. And just like, and that's what it is. Like, look at, we're talking about the certified agile leadership course from the Scrum Alliance. It's not about Scrum leadership, it's about agile. And then mm -hmm. what I've realized and what, not realized, but the core of our training is not about agile leadership. <laughs> we don't teach agile leadership, we yeah. teach revolutionary leadership. We don't yeah. recommend agile leadership. But in fact, agile leadership doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Like there's no meaning to that term. Oh, we just, we, yeah. a leader who can create an <laughs> agile environment. Well. If they can create an agile environment, they're not thinking about agile. They're thinking about a lot of other things. Yeah. So, but, but right, you, I, got you a, know. I got a bit excited there. Was kind of <laughs> no, I do. And, uh, you know, it reminded me, uh, I, I spoke with Mike Cohn last week and he said the, you know, something along the same lines where like, uh, you know, I wish I could just see people uh, like not even call it agile or just like, you know, do it. If it makes sense, do it. And don't even call it. Just if that's like helping you with what you're trying to do, then just do it. Don't put a label on it and you know, call it agile. And I think, yeah. that That's it. Actually, let's just highlight that. Like I remember yeah. like when I first started getting started introducing yeah. agile, when I didn't have permission or authority to do it, I just saying, hey, would it be useful if we just did our work in, in like iterations? And mm -hmm. why don't we just check in how we're doing? And what are we, and just starting, let's plan what we want to do the next two weeks. And I just started doing what I call stealth scrum so that's what i invented on my own right which kind of lines up exactly with what we're talking about and i remember this really landed in my system when goiko Ajek said the most successful yeah. transformation he ever seen in his entire career was when they banned the word agile <laughs> and after a year he came back and it was such an agile environment they're doing all the agile practices everything but they weren't doing agile because the CEO, the CTO had banned the, the word, or CIO had banned the word agile. Uh, so, but, but so when you ban the word agile, it gives you the chance to introduce agile in a way that makes sense. Otherwise mm -hmm. it's like, well, what's our agile maturity? What's this, <laughs> what's that? That's why, and we're working with comparative agility on this. We don't have an agile maturity metric. We've got a organizational performance index, which is like what's happening at the organizational level. Like yeah. what's actually really, really happening is the organization functioning. Because that's what it's all about is about, are you helping your organization function? Not about how agile are you? Or are you doing the agile thing? Or are you being an agile person? Because being mm. agile doesn't mean anything either. Because it's actually yeah. been an evolved, agile's pointing to an evolved culture system. So it's only an incomplete specification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe that's what's next. I mean, like in a sense, maybe that, you know, we've gone through this, agile phase and like you know the more people that i talk to i think more and more people are aligned with this thinking right but you also have the laggers now what we've seen 10 15 years ago <laughs> i'm also seeing a lot of uh that now too so uh, maybe it's a good sign that at least there's more and more people thinking the same way and what you just described because it, it's a sign towards the i think really growth and realizing 
you know, what we needed to do or what we need, need to do uh, in order to help organizations or organizations to help themselves. Um, what, uh, who has like, you know, we all have people that have inspired us and probably we have mentors. Who's, who would you say like has inspired you, still inspires you uh, and has, it, has had a huge impact on what you do? Hmm. Yeah, so that's, um, yeah, so, so I'm an inventor. Yeah. Uh, I'm an inventor and I get these insights and I don't know where they come from, but they're just <laughs> profound. So yeah. um, if I had to describe it, I'd say the, the universe, right? Because that's the source yeah. of most of my information is I'm mm -hmm. just looking at something and then I just get this insight out of the blue. Yeah. So, so for that reason, it's, it's hard. I mean, in my book, I've got a list of like, you know, 20 different people I think and so on and so on and so on. Yeah. But you're looking for a very concrete answer. So I'll give you something, which is this. Yeah. If I look at who embodies uh, what we can call like a more evolved leadership and a more evolved way of being as a leader of a large organization, it would be mm -hmm. Ricardo Semler. Okay. Ricardo I don't Semler. know who Ricardo is. So Ricardo <laughs> Semler is the, the founder of Semco. Okay. Uh, he, you know, he actually created a teal organization. I mean, okay. people co-invent teal organizations all over the world, but he was actually able to do that from age 21. Yeah. And yeah. And so, so he really embodies what evolved leadership really looks like. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, so, so yeah, so that's, uh, I, I would say that's, that would be a good example of, yeah. you know, I think of like, well, okay, I'm reacting this way. Well, how would Ricardo Semler react right now? <laughs> yeah. Um, you said the universe, right? So you, 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 the, the, what I'm thinking is, and I know at least uh, you probably do that, but how much time do you spend uh, meditating and contemplating? Like I'm assuming that, that that's probably a source of some of your innovations or maybe not, yeah. but uh, yeah. Yeah, no, no, it, 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 is, uh, it is. It doesn't, it doesn't really work like that. Um, so, yeah. so what happens is that we all have access to guidance. Mm -hmm. or the wisdom of the universe, right? But the thing is, we're often so busy trying to do and putting in our own effort that we don't take time to be still and just receive, yeah. right? All of us want to get stuff happening in our lives. We all want to get, <laughs> yeah. We're so busy trying to do it ourselves that we mm -hmm. just can't receive. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll just be really clear. My, my daily practice is to do uh, like 10, 15 minutes of yoga. And mm -hmm. what that does is, um, the body and the mind are actually connected. So it actually opens up uh, certain energy channels. And there's a whole mm -hmm. bunch of stuff we can go into, into, you know, Chinese medicine and how there's actually like a primary mechanism of energy distribution in the body, then blah, 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 blah. But we won't go there. Yeah. But, but better, 10, 15 minutes of yoga. And then, uh, then we do a meditation practice uh, of actually a technology that uh, Audrey created. Um, it's actually mm -hmm. a new chakra system for humanity. And so this hasn't, this, we have our website up, but we haven't actually launched training and really announcing it to the world. And so that's yeah. our, our core practice that we do every day. Nice. Um, so, and that, that's about, uh, it depends. Like if we go into a really deep state, mm -hmm. uh, things get slowed down a lot, but it's yeah. roughly about 30 minutes. So it's not like, yeah. No, but not in like hours. Yeah. 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 yeah so, so it's like really about 30, 30, 45 minutes every day. Um, mm -hmm. I think the other part, and this is what we, 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 you know, the tools we teach in our, in our work, um, it, it's actually a, a moment by moment practice, like of an awareness in the moment of, well, am I in an emotionally charged state? How am I mm -hmm. reacting? What's my body feeling like? And then using the tools on an ongoing basis throughout the day to, because if we just spend our whole day in a clear, calm, present, neutral state, everything becomes effortless. Like we're in a flow state. Yeah. yeah. Like our emotions <laughs> drag us out. We get this email. Uh, we get frustrated. We go into fear. Like we are. Yeah. We get some conditioned behavior where someone does something. We trigger and we have a response. Like there's so much that'll happen through daily life where mm. we're in a, a triggered, responding state. So the other part that goes with it is 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 maintaining that state throughout the day. Mm. With you know, just an awareness. And sometimes it'll be like, oh shit, there's this thing going on inside of me, but you know, it feels like really crunchy inside. Uh, and I'll just go and I'll sit quietly and just, and just breathe through it. 
and get back to a resort state. Yeah. So it's almost like all like, you know, just uh, uh, I was talking to uh, Richard uh, Kasparovsky just before uh, our call. And we're talking about that, just, you know, being more aware and practicing self-awareness. Uh, uh, and that seems like, you know, it's a it's a constant, you know, uh, self-awareness practice. Well, uh, self-awareness is a, is really, really important, but without the tools yeah. to act on it. Mm -hmm and create a shift, that's not enough. It's really just the, the entryway, right? Yeah. And most people do not have the tools to mm -hmm. have a good level of self-awareness. Most people are relatively unconscious of what's there happening in their bodies, what's mm -hmm. happening in their emotional system, what's happening with the state of their thinking or cognition. Most people are not even aware or haven't been trained in how to become aware. And mm -hmm. when they become aware of what's happening, how do you take countermeasures to restore them to a more resourceful state. And that's this whole technology we created. So it, it's not this weird Eastern blah, 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 crazy uh, stuff. It's just very practical. Oh, I want to be resourceful at work. How do I do that? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm definitely, you know, as I reached out before, I definitely, you know, as our lives are so busy, like you said, and we're so uh, uh, conditioned, but uh, I'll definitely love to uh, join and, uh, and, uh, learn about these tools uh, maybe yeah. uh, uh, you know you mentioned lalu you mentioned teal uh, what's your take on spiral dynamics and uh, some of the adult development stage frameworks i know everybody has their own opinion i'm interested to yeah. hear uh, yours yeah so my background and training is an engineer <laughs> and my cognitive predisposition is if you can't explain it to me like i'm a five-year-old it's too complicated <laughs> Yeah. And so what happens is I have this unique knack for taking models and theories and simplifying them down to the essence. Mm -hmm. And as part of this business of staring it down the essence, there's an evolution that comes in. So what we've done is create an evolution of, I mean, a lot of people use a lot of different models, like for culture, for, yeah. you know, Kinefin model. So what we've actually done is create an evolution of those models uh, mm -hmm. that have these nuanced refinements that give an unlock. So if I look at spiral dynamics in that context, it's mm -hmm. way too fl flipping complicated. It has yeah. too many words, too many models, too many concepts all mixed together that mm -hmm. you have to have a brain the size of a planet to understand it. And it's very yeah. difficult to put into practice. So that would be my yeah. kind of like high level summary. Mm -hmm. And so there's some people who have brains the size of a planet. God bless them. They can go use yeah. that. But what we've done is create models and tools that normal people like you and me can actually mm -hmm. use to create a, a shift in, in, in ourselves and organizational systems. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, I, I think that's, uh, uh, that's uh, you know, one of the challenges of any kind of framework, anything that's uh, a lot of times too much uh, for for people to to handle and understand, so uh, it's great when somebody can take that and simplify it to a point where it actually can be applicable and people can use it to make change. So, um, well, that's why some people ask me, well, hey, Michael, why don't you do you still use the Schneider culture model that was in your twenty twelve book? And I go like, well, no, because yeah. I tried using it for three years to create culture change, and it doesn't work for that. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't help create culture change. So I stopped using it because exactly. it's really good to understand what's happening, but it doesn't help create change. So change, yeah. yeah, not so much. And that's, that's a good point too. Like so, some things are really good at understanding and, and for you to help you understand what's going on, but uh, not necessarily making the shift or change. So uh, I haven't made that distinction before. I think that's a, that's a really good one. Um, maybe as a last question, what do you do for fun, Michael? What, uh, what do you like to do? So uh, I am so deeply in my life purpose right now of bringing out a profound technology for mm -hmm. shifting people's lives on planet Earth. Like that's really my greatest source of, of inspiration and, and joy. Like it, it's like, it, it's a pleasure to create and work. And it's like, I, I, don't, I don't have a morning where I go, oh, I got to go to work today. Yeah. It, that that's not part of my reality system but what i what i do for like looking after kind of my body and my soul is i, I love going for bicycle rides mm -hmm. uh, walks in nature um 
Mm. You know what I missed right now with COVID is traveling. Yeah. Like I, I really like, there's so many beautiful parts of planet earth that we love visiting and spending time and so many really majestic and magical parts of those places. Like I'm thinking about yeah. botanical gardens in Sydney, Australia, or walking mm-hmm. through Kensington park in, in London, yeah. you know, or, uh, or the town center in, in Antwerp. Uh, yeah. There's just so many beautiful places.